So since we're on camera, I have some inspirational notes for the purpose of posterity. So gravitational wave astronomy is now very much our present, you know, in a spectacular way. So in a way, I, I thought yesterday it doesn't feel quite right to uh, introduce another workshop about the future you know, of gravitational waves. After all, shouldn't we concentrate on enjoying the science that we can finally extract from the beautiful, uh, you know, LIGO signals? Nah, that, that's, that's not how science works, right? We may be happy, but we'll never be satisfied. <laughs> and so it is now, and now we can, with a different, you know, conviction and confidence, we can imagine the future of gravitational waves. And with the LIGO high frequency window open, um, we can plan to conquer uh, other, you know, pieces of promised land in, uh, across the gravitational wave spectrum. Um, and right in this, I had this image, you know, of, uh, of us taking the, the tired masses of uh, LIGO scientists and leading them away from Egypt and, you know, into the promised <laughs> land of Lisa, where the signals are plentiful <laughs> and, and there are no screws to turn. But um, it is a promised land. If we could get sensitivity around one millihertz, uh, so we could do things, you know, we could see the mergers of supermassive black holes um, out to early stage in the universe. We could test uh, general relativity at one part in 10,000, not one part, you know, in 100. We could verify the hairlessness of black holes, so the fact that uh, all their multipolar moments are completely determined by just mass and spin. We will, we would, we will, record uh, thousands, signals from thousands of uh, uh, mergers, uh, again, thousands of compact binaries in our galaxy, and hear the rumble from millions more. Uh, we will witness the intricate, beautiful orbits of small black holes in falling into uh, big ones and, uh, and uh, encoding all the structure of space-time around them. And if we're lucky, we may even detect fossil radiation from the early universe for uh, all kinds of sources that theorists have been able to think about, ranging from in inflation, parametric resonance, uh, first order phase transitions, or even topological defects. So this is what uh, LISA, the space-based observatory LISA, will get us. LISA is now an approved mission uh, with the European Space Agency, and it's undergoing the initial industrial studies. NASA had committed to providing a minor but crucial part of the hardware, and there's every indication that US scientists uh, we'll be able to participate fully in LISA science. And indeed, uh, very soon we will all be invited to participate by joining, the, uh, by joining formally uh, the LISA consortium and its working groups. So LISA is, uh, is not a dream anymore, it's, uh, it's reality. And in fact, uh, uh, I may be professionally biased by having a seven-year-old, but what it feels to me right now, LISA, is a box of Lego with uh, like you know, a few thousand pieces and people are starting to put them together. So the particular puzzle that uh, uh, we're talking about today and that we'll deal with in our study is the LISA science analysis and the LISA data system. So how, so how we will clean, analyze the code and finally interpret the LISA data so that we can begin learning about the universe. Um, so those are the topics of, of the study, and uh, the short course today spans the three elements needed to go from signal to science. One is an understanding of the sources and their physics that will be covered by Kurt Cutler. Uh, one is the uh, capability of accurately computing the gravitational waveforms that those sources emit by solving various approximations of Einstein's equations that will be covered by uh, Deirdre Shoemaker. And uh, finally, uh, our ability to work back from those signals to the physical parameters of, of the sources that emitted them, uh, that would be, that's data analysis, and that will be uh, Stas Babak covering that. So we're extremely lucky to have three world experts to introduce these topics, and uh, let's have uh, the first come up, please. So Dr. Kurt Cutter from the Jet Proportion Laboratory. Kurt was given to us in, by the University of Chicago in his fully formed scientist. Uh, form. Uh, he has been since a uh, professor at Penn State, a, a, a group leader at uh, um, the Max Planck Institute, and since 2005 my prized colleague at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory where he is a senior research scientist. He's worked on many topics in uh, gravitational wave sources and data analysis, and uh, here's Kurt for you. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, um, my aim today is to give you all a, a broad overview of the science that will be done with LISA when it flies 
uh, current uh, launch date, 2034. So your biblical reference was actually a little bit painful since yeah, we know that Moses was in the desert for 40 years. <laughs> and, and I realized that I'll work on, by that launch date, I'll work on Lisa for just about that long, but better late than never. Um, so what is Lisa? Lisa is a planned gravitational wave observatory in space. It's like LIGO, but with much longer arms, 2.5 million kilometer arms instead of 4 million kilometer arms. Um, I will try, I tend to be peripatetic, but I will try to stay here. So um, it's a range, it's three drag-free satellites um, uh, that follow, um, and the range is an equilateral triangle with 2.5 million kilometer arms. Um, because the arms are so long, that means Lisa will be sensitive in a frequency band about 10 to the fourth lower than what LIGO is sensitive to. Um, the, the, uh, the, the, the constellation will follow the Earth around the sun, lagging by about 20 degrees, so about 1 AU from the sun. And as it goes around, it always, it, the constellation is tilted to 60 degrees to the ecliptic. That's the magic um, angle such that <clears throat> just by Newton's laws, it stays equilateral triangle. Um, and it sort of rotates once all the way around as, um, uh, as it rotates as it, as it goes around the sun, coming back to its original position after 360 degrees. Um, this motion of LISA around the sun and its rotation is actually very important for the science you get out of LISA, since the motion around the sun tends to Doppler shift whatever signal you get, which provides you a lot of the information about where the source is. That's in comparison to LIGO, where you use triangulation but arrival times between sources, different detectors. Lisa does it mostly through the Doppler shift. And you also get in also information from the, by the fact that um, the, the, the plane of the orbit is constantly changing, which means you're sensitive to different polarizations as you go around, which carries information both about the polarization and because the polarization is as, as always orthogonal to the direction of the incoming gravity waves, it also contains information about the position. Um, as Michaela said, this is a ESA NASA mission. ESA at the moment is, is, sort of is, scheduled, is uh, on the hook for about 80% of the cost, and NASA pl plans to provide about 20%. I said it's a three drag free satellites, and again, uh, sensitive to gravity waves in roughly the 10 to the minus 4 to the 10 to the minus 1 hertz band. Um, so, what are the LISA sources? Um, because it's looking at different frequency regime from LIGO, it's sensitive to different types of sources. Uh, especially interesting will be, um, well, at least we'll measure thousands of compact white dwarf binaries in our galaxy. We'll individually measure about 3,000 of them. And, uh, as a, and another 30 million will be forming, be hard to resolve individually, but will form something of a confusion background. Um, LIGO measures the, the, the mergers of 10 to 100 solar mass black holes. Um, LISA will be sensitive to the mergers of 10 to the 4 to 10 to the 7 solar mass black holes um, up to very high redshift, roughly z equals 20. And even some smaller masses, but to lower z. Um, so uh, 10 to the 4 to 10 solar mass black holes, we call these massive black holes. Sometimes you might think of massive black holes as being 10 to the 8th or 10 to the 9th. We're thinking sort of massive black holes on sort of the lower mass side. So you, as you probably know that the, our galaxy, the Milky Way, contains a black hole at the center of 3 times 10 to the 6th solar masses. So it's more at that level that we're interested in. Um, Lisa will measure the in spirals of compact stars into black holes. Again, 10 to the 5, 10 to the 6th solar mass black holes. The compact objects being black holes, neutron stars, and white dwarfs. Um, these follow very, very complicated orbits. Um, you'll, and you'll learn a great deal about the system from, from discovering them. And these are the things we th we're pretty sure we will see with LISA. Um, in addition, there are more speculative sources, such as um, especially sources from the early universe. Phase transitions from the early universe could produce the stochastic background strong enough to be measured. Um, could be burst from cosmic superstrings. These are strings. In string theory, you can, in some versions of it, get strings that are you know, as large as the Hubble scale. And um, cusps that form on those could pr produce bursts that are observed. 
So these are more speculative things. Um, I'm going to just recommend a couple uh, references for people interested. I can't, this is a broad overview, but these are, get somewhat more detail. Um, uh, these are recent ones, even though the LISA architecture has remained pretty stable over the last 20 years or so, um, there have been some changes over time. So I wanted to give you recent references, and the science case for it has evolved somewhat over time. So the two references I would recommend strongly are the gravitational universe, which is about 20 pages. Um, and then the LISA proposal that was submitted to ESA for the selection for L3, maybe about 40 pages or so. And um, since I used to give a lot of talks on LISA, but most of them are like eight years old, so I grabbed almost all my figures from one of these two. Um, okay, this is an introductory talk, so I'm going to give a two-slide introduction to gravity waves. Uh, hopefully most people know what they are, but if you don't, here's a, a, a brief introduction. So, start out with electromagnetic radiation. We know in the dipole approximation that um, uh, electromagnetic waves are caused by the first, uh, proportion of the first time derivative of the dipole moment of some system and fall off as, of course, one over the distance from the system, the strength. In, so, it, gravity is actually rather similar, except there can be no dipole moment for a gravitational system. Because the next order is the quadrupole. And so the gravity wave strength can, say, say, is, or is proportional to the second time derivative of the quadrupole moment of the source. Um, and the strongest sources we tend to know about tend to be binaries, which clearly have a time changing quadrupole moment. Um, so here's a, the, the, so you imagine a binary, it's quadrupole moment, which is the sum of the masses times their radial separation from the center, R squared, basically. Um, the signal is Hij is basically the second time derivative of this. Again, this is a tensor. Then projected perpendicular to the line of sight and has trace taken out. Uh, so it's, um, there's no, just, so it's just a shear, not an expansion or contraction. And then it goes like one over D. Um, the second time derivative, uh, you, so, because gravity waves are coming out of the system, it shrinks due to loss of energy, and it's easy using the quadrupole formula, the gravitational version of the electromagnetic dipole formula, to figure out the rate of in spiral. Here are the answers. First, it gets much faster near the end, because as the frequency get, goes up, that means they're closer together, spinning faster, and they're putting more gravity waves out, and then in spiraling faster. So the FDT, where F is the emitted gravity wave frequency, it actually goes like F to 11 thirds. And then as they spin closer together, again, the second time derivative increases faster than this, this R squared term decreases, so the amplitude rises up as well. So what you get is a chirp signal. So it's something that rises in amplitude and much faster in frequency. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, the sort of what does it do, these gravitational waves will pr pr produce a shear in, in space time. So if I imagine having a ring of particles, say, in the board, and gravity waves coming perpendicular to the board, it would cause the ring not to change in area, but to change in ellipticity. It's sort of longer in one direction, short in the other direction, then back to its original, then long and short in perpendicular directions and then on back and forth, back and forth. That's one polarization. And the second polarization is this, exactly the same thing, but rotated 45 degrees. 45 degrees in gravity, and for electromagnetic ration, it would be 90 degrees that rotates it, but the gravity is a spin two particle, so it's 45 degrees. And this is what happens. So when gravity waves pass by LISA, it, it causes a shear in the LISA plane, and that's measured by laser interferometry. Um, LIGO uses real laser interferometry, actually interfering all the signals. In LISA, it's a sort of synthetic laser interferometry where you combine the signals from different spacecraft and, and put the gravity wave signal together on the ground or maybe in space. But it's done in, in software. In using special, special combinations that cancel other noise, noise sources. Um, Okay. Right, so 
as Michaela said, gravity wave astronomy has become a real field. I spent you know, most of the last 25 years talking in talks like this, talking about all the science that would happen in gravitational wave astronomy, to the point that I think not even my relatives believed me. So everyone was happy, especially my relatives. When, like, when two years ago, the first uh, merger of black holes was discovered, so almost, yeah, two years ago, almost exactly. Well, it's September 2015, and then published maybe three months later. And that was a merger of two roughly 30 solar mass black holes into a 60 solar mass black hole. It's very exciting. Um, certain all our, the way we pictured black holes up until then was like 10 solar mass black holes. We didn't even know black holes as big could exist, up to 60 solar masses. So we were a little surprised by how strong the signal was, which was great. Um, and in the, in the last two years or so, we now have, um, let's see, five known, or no, six actually, six known mergers of black holes. And this is the way this is. You see the, you see the, the masses of the two inspiring objects and the mass of the black hole it's formed. So six, that's a lot, at least a lot compared to what I used to know. And then perhaps the most, maybe most, the most exciting discovery um, August 17th of last year, um, there's a me measurement by LIGO again, I'm still talking about LIGO, of the, and Virgo, of two inspiring neutron stars um, discovered by LIGO and Virgo. And here, as you see, they're, they're sort of the chirp in time frequency space, right? So the frequency is going up and, um, as time goes on. And here you see other plots of uh, this was almost immediately confirmed by Fermi, which saw a peak in gamma rays about 1.7 seconds later, and by Integral as well, which saw a peak about 1.7 seconds later, right? And then there was off to the races in other forms of electromagnetic band. Within about 12 hours, there was an optical identification of the host galaxy, which gave a very precise position. And then after that, it was discovered in X-rays, the infrared, um, the optical, radio emission, I think just about everything except neutrinos, basically. Um, and so, and from that we've learned a, a huge amount about this system that we never knew before. Um, and I guess I can get, just get personal for a second. I was you know, working on this 20 years ago in and you know, calculating what we would see when two neutron stars collided, and we got the neutron, we got the gravity wave signal right, but I don't know anybody who was this optimistic about all the electromagnetic signatures. We were hoping maybe we'd see gamma rays. Maybe, please, give us gamma rays. Or, uh, or maybe one other. Um, so this was tremendous. Um, the only one I know who, who, actually, who uh, foresaw all the optical emission was Bodan Paczynski of Princeton, who was a very smart guy. Um, so this was, this has put a lot of wind at our sails for Lisa and, uh, and has um, the, the LIGO discoveries and has, you know, helped stir a great deal of interest. And the other thing that stirred a great deal of interest was the successful launch two years ago, almost exactly, of Lisa Pathfinder, which is a technology demonstration mission for Lisa. It, it, we demonstrated about, I would say, roughly two thirds of the technologies that Lisa will use. Um, it's only one satellite, not three, so it can't do all the optical uh, interferometry part that LISA will use it. But it does test the drag-free system. Um, LISA requires, so the way LISA has the satellite follow um, basically geodesics is inside the satellite there are two test masses um, that are shielded from external influence and have to have follow G and have to have the forces on them so small there are they're like three times ten to the minus fifteen newtons per root hertz. Um, uh, so basically the goal of Lisa Pathfinder was to prove that you could do that, or rather the goal was to prove you could do it within a factor of seven. So I think that was close enough. And Lisa Pathfinder exceeded expectations. Right on the day it turned it on, it, it met that requirement. It worked instantly, and as people worked harder to understand why it, gravitational imbalances and other forces, it eventually got to the point where the acceleration noise at well, the, in Lisa Pathfinder was actually below the Lisa requirement. So we exceeded not by a factor, not, didn't come just within a factor of seven. We got, so red is the Lisa requirement, um, blue was actually what was obtained. So the success of Lisa Pathfinder 
and you know, the detection of gravitational waves by LIGO, again, put a lot of wind at the sails um, of LISA, the one we're talking about today. Um, so now, um, a lot of people, when I talk about LISA, the first question is, well, you've just detected gravity waves with LIGO, why do you need a space-based version? Haven't you just done it? So I said some of this in the last few slides, but let me emphasize first the, the differences between LIGO and LISA, and then mention some of the similarities. That was a bad idea. Um, the, 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 as I said, the difference is that because LISA has much longer arms, it looks at a frequency band about 10 to the fourth lower, not so much, not 100 hertz, but a hundredth of a hertz, roughly speaking, 10 to the minus four to 10 to the minus one hertz. And because of that, we look at different kinds of sources, sources with much longer frequencies, um, uh, white dwarfs that are, that are um, emitting at 10 to the minus three or 10 to the minus two hertz, very large black holes, which have lower frequencies when they emerge, 10 to five, 10 to six solar mass black holes, not 10 to the one or 10 to the two. Um, the other big difference is that, well, LIGO sources have been, uh, tend to be in band for, you know, seconds to minutes. Well, uh, all the discoveries, they were seconds to minutes long. Um, everything's happening slower in LISA. The sources tend to be in band order months to years or more than that. So uh, LISA will see thousands, which means many thousands typically will be on at the same time. So LIGO tends to see one source at a time, one wait a, you know, a few weeks, see another, wait a few weeks, see another, or wait a month or something like that. Well, with LIGO, as soon as you turn it on, at least uh, um, you'll see many sources at once. And so then that part of the difficulty becomes then disentangling them all from the data stream. Because the data stream looks the same. It's basically one or two channels of strain. Um, so those are the differences. One of the similarities, well, again, uh, is among the strongest sources that we know about are binaries. So Lisa will mostly see binaries. So they'll be the bread and butter source, um, just different binaries, not merging neutron star binaries, but white dwarfs that are still well separated, or merging black holes that are, say, 10 to the 6 solar masses, or, or again, say, 10 solar mass black holes falling into 10 to the 5 or 10 to the 6 solar mass black holes. Um, another similarity, and this I'll have a probably, is that, almost really, is that most, well, we can talk about the gravity wave signal most of what we'll learn, I guess, again, just like LIGO and the neutron stars, will be from electromagnetic observations that are used in conjunction with LISA. Um, and we don't know exactly what those will be. But presumably, but we, there are certainly lots of scenarios where you do get electromagnetic radiation. And presumably, we'll find out when LISA is turned on what you see. And that will help us figure out what's going on. That's a guess, but I would, I'd bet, willing to bet on it. Here's a little bit more about LISA sources. Um, here's the LISA noise curve, the sort of dotted, the dashed black and green one, again with the lowest point between 10 to the minus 3 and 10 to the minus 2 hertz. And then we have a illustrations of a couple sources. Um, the way these, this diagram works is you've you got a lot of points here, the, a lot of purple points. The purple points are all of the individually observable white dwarf, white dwarf <coughs> binaries in the galaxy. And a, and a smattering of neutron star, neutron star, black hole, black hole binaries to the galaxy. They're just more of the white dwarves. And the, um, the signal of noise you expect is that basically the height of the, the point, in signal is one year, above the noise curve. That's the convention for how these are drawn. The typical you know, signal noise of seven, if you look at this, or 10, something like that. And the blue X's here, or blue asterisks, are actually binaries we know about already. They're called verification binaries. They are white dwarf binaries that we know are out there. We, we're in the sky, they are. We have a decent enough estimate of their masses that we can say LISA will detect them. So you turn them on and they should be there. And so we call them as verification sources because they verify that LISA is working and they help calibrate it. Um, other things, so that, that's, those are these points here. Then the, for the others, uh, the frequency evolves. So these are basically monochromatic. They evolve on much longer time scales in a few years. Um, merging black holes evolve, uh, do evolve, sort of sweep through a lot of the LISA band in, say, a year. 
So this, for instance, this, is, this let's look at this middle curve. That's an example I'm reading right. It's about 10 to the 6 solar masses to, I think, this is a total solar mass. So I think this is uh, 2 10 to the 5th solar mass black holes, 2 5 times 10 to the 5th solar mass black holes, making 10 to the 6th, entering a Lisa band about a month before merger, having this sweep and frequency. And this signal to noise is basically some, signal noise squared is some average of the integral of this over that in log space, I won't say exactly what it is, but also a good estimate by I. You can, you can almost do these, the, the conventions are you can almost estimate the signal noise by I, and a first good guess is in fact it's the order one times the, the greatest dif distance between the highest point, that greatest separation between the signal curve and the noise curve will give you the signal of noise within a factor of two or three or something like that. So you can see right away what's observable and what's not. These are the tracks of a few um, merging black hole binaries at z equals 3. Um, the red curves here that are falling off are supposed to represent um, an Emery signal, that is to say, a signal from a single, can say, 10 solar mass black hole falling into a 10 to the 5 or 10 to the 6 solar mass black hole. I can't remember which choice was made here. And it looks like three curves, but that final this figure, it's actually just these curves, these, these will. Um, the Emery's will, are, will typically be eccentric, meaning they'll radiate a number of harmonics. And so these are just the different harmonics of, the, of one signal. And you also see here, in say in blue and black, something uh, that sort of think, sources that will also be seen in LISA. So if you take the first, LIGO. thank you, I meant LIGO. Thank you very much. That would have been understand, not understandable at all if you had known. Okay, great. We'll also be seen in LIGO. If you take, for instance, the first LIGO detection of the two 30 solar mass black holes um, that merged into a 10 to the you know, 60 solar mass black hole, if, if Lisa had been flying, you know, um, five, well, now, no, seven years ago, you'd have seen that binary in the Lisa band and it would have been detectable. And um, and not only that, but because from release detection, you would have a, a heads up on exactly on a sky position and when they would have, have met, and so you would have known quite a bit about the binary even before LIGO saw it. And we expect that Lisa will see, you know, several of these um, galactic binaries that end, end up becoming LIGO sources within a few years. Or if not LIGO by then, there'll be some advanced LIGO, advanced ground based source. Okay, so uh, estimated rates, um, again, we'll, we'll find out when it's built. But black hole, big black hole murders, I think maybe 10 to 100 a year. Extreme mass ratio wind spirals, maybe 5 to 50 a year. Galactic binaries, maybe 3,000 resolvable, with 30 million forming an unresolvable confusion background. So now I'm going to talk about each of these in turn, the main sources. So why do we have black holes merging anyway? And the basic idea, the thing you have to, have to know about in astronomy is that structure uh, is basically forms from the bottom up. It is um, small galaxies were formed, they merge to form larger galaxies, which merge to form larger galaxies. Um, typically a galaxy like ours will have been the product of, you know, it's somewhere between 10 and 100 mergers um, in the merger history. Um, if a lot of these earlier galaxies have big, we know that the galaxies today, basically all of them have big black holes at their center. If a sizable percentage, fraction of these other galaxies have black holes at their centers, then when they merge, um, tidal friction with the other stars in the galaxy will bring them very close together, usually so close together that eventually gravitational radi radiation reaction takes over and the radiation emitted by the gravity will force them the rest of the way into merger. So um, the number of these things we see then is, is strongly dependent on, you know, roughly speaking, how many of them actually, actually have black holes and what their masses are, which is what I think we'll determine. Um, right. So we'll hope to elucidate this whole process. Um, these will be fairly high signal to noise events, like hundreds or so. And the signals will have many, many cycles in them. Um, 
thousands, tens of thousands. So one will tend to be able to measure the parameters of these binaries to exquisite accuracy. So typically, one expects that these will measure the, the, the masses of these guys shown here. So it's, you know, a part in 10 to the 3 or 10 to the 2, something like that. And measure this, even the spin of the larger ones, and maybe, you know, between 1% and 10%. Um, um, that's important um, because, well, first, it's, it's good to know, it helps trace out the sort of the, the whole fill in the picture of how all the mergers, but the spin tells you a lot about how the black hole was formed in the first place. Black holes, we don't know whether these black holes are the centers of galaxies, were formed mostly by accretion of gas, which would form an accretion disk and tend to spin them up to near maximum rotation, or mostly by the collision of, of smaller black holes which would tend to then average out a bit or just grow stochastically in the spin. So hopefully it would distinguish those two, and we have another way of distinguishing those two at the moment. So in this grand slalom, I've now finished our major source. Now I'm going to talk about um, extreme mass ratio in spirals. Um, the basic idea is that you, you know, occasionally, um, so there's a swarm of, you know, millions of stars pretty close to the central black holes and galaxies. Um, these are stars, uh, both main sequence stars and dead stars, white dwarfs, black holes, and neutron stars. Um, the, re the regular stars cannot form gravitational wave signals of the kind that are observable, and the reason is they're too fluffy, too low density to actually survive all the way into the, 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 the big black hole. They get tidally disrupted before then. But, but dead stars, which are much denser, um, neutron stars, black holes, white dwarfs, are dense enough, and, and, and Lisa will be able to see them. Um, the guess is that most of what we'll see will be 10 or maybe now 50 or 100 solar mass black holes falling in just because they have a much stronger signal. There aren't as many of them, but they have stronger signals. You can see them further out. Plus, mass segregation in galaxies tend to bring the heaviest things close to the center anyway. Um, uh, there, there's at least three different ways for, by which you actually get these final event signals, but the one that's maybe easiest to understand and I would guess provides the biggest signal is in this big cloud of, of, of of stars around the central black hole, occasionally, you know, the, as, as they run, enter, run near each other, they get little kicks in momentum space. Eventually, one comes to, to a place that sort of is sort of stochastically driven to very low momentum, which means it's going to fall right towards the center. That's what this, the, that this is, this is a picture of a lost cone, which is basically a, an area of momentum space um, angular momentum space where the thing is now falling nearly straight down. Um, so this the, our shorthand for extreme mass ratio in spiral is Emery. Um, and these are quite complicated orbits. Most of the time we see them, they're within about 10 times the Schwarzschild radius or five times the Schwarzschild radius from the center of the black hole. So they're very extreme. Um, you know, well, typical velocities are like a third the speed of light. So the sort of various relativistic effects when one, one thinks about in stars, like um, peri um, precession of perihelion, are all on steroids in these systems. You get an incredibly strong precession of perihelion. You also get precession of the orbital plane due to uh, coupling between the, of the spin of the, of, um, the large system and, uh, and, the, and the orbit of the smaller system. So you get this um, very complicated signal and of you know, 10 to the fifth cycles. This is what a small snapshot of it might look like. Um, the fact, sort of the fact that, it's, that this isn't um, uniform means that you're seeing the effect that it's elliptical a bit. So uh, sort of higher frequency part is getting closer to the black hole. Um, and this larger modulation is due to the precession of the orbital plane, right? Um, the fact that this, these things are so complicated, these waves are so complicated, actually is, is good news. It means they are very rather sensitive to the conditions of the binary. And so with Emery's, one expects to be able to measure the parameters to really exquisite accuracy. So measuring the, the mass of the larger black hole is a 10 to the minus 4, 10 to the minus 5, 10 to the minus 6. You know, think, unheard of, I think, in other areas of astronomy when it matches that well. Um, measuring the spin of the big black hole, 10 to the minus 4, 
um, initial eccentricity to high accuracy. And this one is talking about uh, the quadruple moment is talking about the test of general relativity, which I will talk about again later. Uh, for, um, in the Kerr metric, the quadruple moment of the central object is determined perfectly by the mass and spin of the object, is completely determined. But you can put in by hand some discrepancy as a test of general relativity and, and see it would, how that, in an ad hoc way, would affect the orbit, the quadruple moment, and then constrain how well the quadruple moment actually agrees with what you expect from general relativity as a consistency test. And that discrepancy, that difference, will be measurable to say 10 to the minus 3 or so. Almost all, most of these sources um, will actually not be things that you are visible to your eye. Um, when you look at the data, they're below the noise, but the signal builds up over time because these are long lasting signals. Um, and so the basic way one will look for these signals is match filtering. Um, I'm sure Stas will talk about this at length, but let me just do one transparency on it, just like, again, broad overview. The idea is the measured signal is the instrumental noise plus some gravity wave strain, um, which you know for a, any given binary parameters, you can predict it. So you take your, what you predict is the gravity wave signal and multiply it, this is the basic idea, multiply it by the, the measured signal, integrate over time, the sum of two pieces, a noise times signal part, which is stochastic, so it grows like two to one half, and then a signal, signal, a signal squared piece, so which grows with linearly with time. And I've, I've done this in time space, that the real one, you would do it, the, the optimal version actually is in frequency space with a weighting that um, takes in the effect that the, the noise is in constant in frequency. But this gives you the idea. And then the ad signal noise ends up being the RMS size of the gravity wave signal divided by the RMS size of the noise times the square root of the number of cycles. So it can give you a big win because for these emeries, for example, you'll have like 10 to the fifth cycles. So you get a factor of like a square root of 10 to the fifth or 300 improvement. So something that is, was a factor of 30 below the noise, if you integrate out and you know the signal, becomes 10. So how do we construct um, gravitational waveforms? Well, then this is, again, a prelude to another talk this morning, this one by Deirdre. Um, uh, so there, if, for those who don't know, there is no exact solution known for the two-body problem in general relativity, unlike Newtonian gravity. Uh, so we have to find the, way, the orbit and the waveform by various approximation methods. Um, one of them is, is numerical relativity, solving Einstein's equations on a computer. Um, one is the post-Newtonian approximation, that's a very old method, still being developed, but basically considers any situation as Newtonian plus corrections, where the corrections are an expansion in V over C, right? As velocities go to small, it becomes Newtonian um, orbit, and then eventually you get, you get, then you get precession of perihelion at higher orders and eventually in spiral end. And this has now been carried out to quite high order. Uh, analytically. There's the effect of one body approximation. Um, what to say about that? Um, so just as in Newtonian uh, physics, you, you solve the, the two body problem by making it one body. The idea is to basically mock up a one body equation for the two body motion, but put in extra terms, like spin, spin orbit terms, and spin orbit terms, and things like that, um, and the extra powers, and then to sort of use, partly get those, the um, the coefficients from those terms analytically and partly from guidance from numerical relativity. And lastly, the, um, so I think is going to talk about these especially. So I'll talk about this one other one, which is an expansion in the mass ratio, which is what you need for emeries. Just to give you a flavor for what goes on. So for emeries, which again, we're talking about a, like a 10 to the solar mass black hole spiraling into a 10 to the sixth solar mass black hole. So the mass ratio is 10 to the minus 5. Uh, a little guy over the big guy. So then it's natural to anybody, you know, who studies science, to think of a, um, this, this term, this like, ratio, as a small parameter and expand in that small parameter. Um, so at lowest order, then where actually the mass ratio goes to zero, you just have a very test mass 
a test point mass going around a black hole, it's just a geodesic of the Kerr orbit. And we know those analytically. It's just a no in spiral at all. To first order, you start to get in spiral, radiation reaction. Um, but um, this it gets quite hard to calculate pretty soon because if you treat the small particle as a point particle, which is the easiest thing to do, is the easiest way to treat it, at the certainly the lowest order, um, you find out that the radiation reaction force diverges at the point particle, and so must be regularized, a little bit like the regularized expressions in quantum field theory. Um, the prescriptions for doing this were developed in 97 by two different groups, Wall and Quinn, and Mino, Sasaki, and Tanaka. Um, but what we really need to get, to be, to get all the information um, possible from these orbits is an expansion through m over m, little m over big m squared, which is not accessible yet. This is still an object of current research. The first order is pretty much in hand, I think. But if people are still working on the next order, which is about what we need. And people have been working on this for 20 years, but we have another 17, and I'm confident they'll make it. Um, uh, the last source I'm going to talk about is the most numerous, or one of the last sources I'm going to talk about is the most numerous. I said Lisa will measure thousands of galactic binaries, um, white, mostly white dwarf binaries, but also neutron star, neutron star binaries. We're just a couple, some of the things we'll learn, but we don't know how many of them there are, right? So just the census. We don't know their spatial location. We don't know their frequency distribution. Um, their frequency distribution will actually tell you a lot about how mass transfer works in these, in white dwarf, white dwarf binaries. The idea is, I've, so far I've always talked about binaries just going in. Um, in white dwarf, white dwarf binaries, one second. If the mass ratio is bigger than around three or so, <clears throat> what actually happens is they go in, um, the, the, the more heavy one starts stripping mass from the, from the lighter, fluffier one, and there's that mass transfer actually ends up starting to move the binary back out again. But though the exact, and, <clears throat> so, so, so a lot of the binaries you'll see are actually will be in the stage of moving out, not moving in. And so the distribution of them and their, and their frequency will tell you a lot, will give you a lot of clues as to the mass transfer, of which is very poorly understood at the moment. Um, <clears throat> the other thing, as I said, is a nice thing about these binaries is that a few that are observed by LISA will be observable by LIGO or you know, future LIGOs um, a few years later. And the information you get will help you localize them and teach them many things. So, and so far, I've now talked about the sources we're pretty confident are out there, um, all of which are binaries of one form or another, um, binaries in our galaxy, Emery's, and big black hole mergers. There are also more speculative sources that Lisa might see. I'm just going to mention one of them here. Um, and that would be a, a first order, strongly first order phase transition in the early universe. We know that the universe uh, underwent at least several phase transitions. Um, there's, um, there's the uh, electro a weak phase transition where the Higgs particle falls to the bottom of its potential and all the particles we know get their masses. Um, there's a, it's, it's really the strong coupling phase transition, which maybe it's called uh, S23, I can't remember what they call it, but it's this strong phase transition um, where, 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 where quarks form into nuclei, right? Um, in, in phase transitions that are strongly for first order, what happens is you get bubbles of the real vacuum forming, nucleating in the false vacuum, and then they grow. And, and then as they grow, they collide with other bubbles, and the collisions produce gravitational waves. Um, and those gravitational waves, a huge amount of energy can come out, and then it gets redshifted all the way from there, of course, from then to now. But a, a phase transition at the electric wake scale, if you look at the gravity waves produced by it, it would be just basically in the LIGO band, in the LISA band today. So that would be lucky for us. Um, uh, right, so in, in, a, in the standard model, that, that transition is not um, strongly first order. It doesn't produce a lot of big bubble, bubbles with a lot of energy. But there are 
you know, easy, simple extension of the standard model, some supersymmetric extensions, which give strongly first order phase transitions and a lot of energy turned into gravitational waves. This omega gravity wave is a fraction of the closure density of the universe that's in gravitational waves from this kind of event. Um, one estimate would be around, you know, 10 to minus 10 or so. Um, and that's basically the level at which LISA could detect it. So this is a potential LISA source. And I would say that, you know, there, I would, there are a number of potential LISA sources, and I, I wouldn't bet on all of them, but I would probably bet on some of them. Um, something people always ask about is test of general relativity. Can you test general relativity with LISA? So here's my little very personal spiel on this. Um, I don't think this is the party line, but this is my line. Um, I think it's the party line, I don't know. Um, so the problem with testing um, any theory is that the only framework that I know that you know, we completely understand and completely clear is the Bayesian framework. And in the Bayesian framework, you have alternative theories and you use the data as evidence to then prefer one or the other in a quantitative manner. The problem with doing that with general relativity is you need an alternative. <laughs> and at the moment, I don't know of any good, decent alternative to general relativity. Um, it, in the 60s and 70s, there were a whole passel of them, but most of them were, were already ruled out by the binary pulsar, um, and then other things since then. So what are you tested against? Um, I don't think that, that means there actually are no tests. Uh, personally, I think the Bayesian framework just doesn't capture everything we want to do in science. It's incredibly useful, but I don't think it captures all the thoughts we want to have about objects. So instead what one has is consistency tests. For example, um, given the in spiral part of a massive black hole merger, just that part, you can determine the masses and spins of the two big black holes to pretty high accuracy. Then with a numerical relativity, you can predict what the what the uh, waveform will come out when will come out when they merge, and then when it, there's a ring down, and you compare what you get at the end to what you get at the beginning. And if it's and if they don't, you know, it's back to the drawing board. If there's a strong disagreement, if they're, if they're not within error bars. Um, another one is again you can put in as I mentioned Emery's. I like this less, even though I've done it. Um, you can imagine ad by ad hoc putting in extra terms in the equations of motion. Imagine that the central body is not quite a black hole of Kerr, but has a quadrupole moment, and see how well you can then constrain it to the Kerr balance. That's the kind of thing you do. And that actually brings me to the end of my talk. So I just, um, I'm flashing up just an early slide as a summary slide. And so you can sort of, that's the, memory and uh, I'm open to questions.